All right, and we're recording. Hey gang, Andy here, and today I wanted to do something a little different. Um, earlier, I was doing some hard drive cleaning, a little early spring cleaning, and I found an old video of mine from back in 2016 where I answered some questions about Japan, and I really didn't like the quality of the video of that time, so I decided today to just reshoot it. So I got the uh, 20 questions pulled up here, and uh, we're just going to go right through them. So welcome to Japan Tag 2.0. Or 2.0, there we go. <laughs> it was originally started by Emily Louise Maithland back in 2016, so uh, this one's a little late, but uh, better late than never, right? So let's start off with question number one. What first made you interested in Japan? Now, I answered this question in full form for my 100th episode of Andy Japandi, so if you want the full version... You can go ahead and watch that video. But if you want kind of the Cliff's Notes version, my cousins were stationed out in Yokosuka, Japan back in the early to mid 90s. And they would send me uh, souvenirs from Japan, like chopsticks, bowls, cups. Uh, one time they sent me like a whole packet of coins and telling me like what their relative value was in the States. And I thought it was just like really cool. And then one day they sent me a little Lego toy boat. And the interesting thing about that is um, the little pamphlets and stuff inside. So they at the time had a little packet to show you how to put the thing together um, But they also had a little pamphlet on the different Lego sets they had so back then I think it was like forest space town pirates, you know stuff like that and uh, the interesting thing was that it was written entirely in Japanese now keep in mind again this was the early to mid 90s so my access to computers was non-existent at that time. You know, there really wasn't a widespread usage of the internet. So my access to things Japanese was very limited. So I pretty much had what my cousins would send to me and maybe some books and stuff like that. I kept that little uh, pamphlet with me because I liked looking at the characters and I thought it was just like really interesting to see something that I would see on a fairly regular basis but written in an entirely different language. It's just like so cool to me. So, um, and then from there, during like the late 90s, early 2000s, when the anime boom started, got into anime, and then when YouTube started, got into J-Vlogs, and it just kind of progressed from there. So question number two, what first brought you to Japan? So for those who don't know, I was in the United States Navy from 2010 to 2015. Back in 2013, I got orders out to USS Lassen DDG-82, who at the time was st was homeported out in Yokosuka, Japan. They've since moved back stateside, though. But um, back when I was on USS Kurt FFG-38, 38 Special, we were getting a whole bunch of orders and stuff to different ships because uh, the Kurtz was decomming at the time. So I really wanted to go out to Japan, but. Everybody said I would most likely be stationed stateside on another frigate because I'd just gotten out of school. But I talked a lot with my chain of command as well as the detailer and they couldn't really find me any orders to any of the stateside frigates. So they pretty much had no choice but to send me back to school to learn the uh, the newer sonar system. And then from there cut me orders to Lassen. So I went out to Japan from 2013 to 2015 when I eventually came back stateside. So question number three, what do you love about living in Japan? So there's a lot to love about Japan, at least for me anyway. One of the things I loved most about living in Japan was feeling safe. You know, I didn't have to worry about getting jumped, getting my stuff stolen, somebody breaking into my house. Didn't have to worry about any guns or anything like that. I just felt incredibly safe living out in Japan. Even though being an American, I'm used to like locking my doors and stuff like that. So I, I always managed to lock the door to my apartment and lock my bike up and stuff like that. That was kind of ingrained into my brain. But I still had that little peace of mind knowing that even in the event that I might forget to lock something up, it's you know not gonna get stolen or anything like that. So that really, put my mind at ease. And another thing I loved about living in Japan was just the general aesthetic of stuff out there. Um, I just liked how things were arranged, parks and stuff like that, that were very nature focused. So even in the midst of a big city like Tokyo, you could go to these little parks and just feel completely away from the city. So you can get that little peace of mind. And so question number four, 
what has surprised you most about living in Japan? So I think probably the big thing, no pun intended, uh, that really uh, threw me off about uh, living in Japan was the amount of fat people that were there. So I'd heard about on all the blogs and videos and stuff like that, that Japan has one of the lowest obesity ratings in the world. I think at the time it was like maybe 1% or less of the population was overweight or obese. And when I got out to Yokosuka, there was just a lot of fat people there. <laughs> you know, so I would just walk around doing my thing and I'd see like salary men with their beer bellies hanging out and stuff like that. And it was just like, Whoa, must be all that nice American food, I guess. <laughs> Just saying. Question number five, what's keeping you here? So I'm not in Japan anymore. Uh, like I said earlier, I moved back to America in 2015, uh, but I am looking to come back to Japan um, at some point. Uh, if you guys have been keeping up with my vlogs and stuff, you'll know that I want to transfer out to Temple University to finish up my degree. Question number six, when you think of Japan, you think, it would probably have to be like the food and the drinks and stuff like that. So I have a lot of good memories eating some of the food out there and drinking some of the more uh, adult beverages, <laughs> as well as the non-alcoholic kind. So, you know, you got your curries, ramen, um, chuhai, which is my drink of choice. Uh, for those who don't know what chuhai is, uh, it's short for sochu highball. Um, sochu is like Japanese rice wine, rice liquor. Um, that's the main alcoholic base. It's kind of like vodka but a little bit less you know stressful on the throat and then you combine that with club soda and some kind of uh, fruit flavor and that's basically too high it's a very simple drink it's really good and it doesn't feel like you're drinking any alcohol so that's something I certainly enjoy if you get canned too high a lot of the flavors are seasonal so it's always fun to drink the uh, seasonal flavors like you'd have cherry during uh, the spring, it would have like a can covered in like cherry blossoms and stuff like that. It was really cool. And then in the summertime, you'd have like pineapple and green apple. And those are probably my two favorite flavors of Chu High ever. But I just really enjoyed Chu High. It would get me drunk, get me there for very cheap. Question number seven. What's your favorite Japanese word or phrase? So one of the words that I liked using, especially when describing my job back when I was living out in Japan was kaigun, which is Japanese for Navy. Now I know a lot of the foreigners when they were trying to introduce me and try to say what I did and stuff like that, they would just use the gairaigo version of that. They would just basically pronounce Navy if it were pronounced by a Japanese person. So it'd be like Navy, but I would just use kaigun. So a lot of Japanese people would be impressed by my usage of that word. They'd be like, eh? Uh, moving on to question number eight. What's the most exciting, outrageous thing you've ever done in Japan? So there's been several of those, um, mostly just the gathering, the YouTube gatherings, you know, usually twice a year out in Tokyo. Um, it was always a lot of fun to meet up with fellow YouTubers, especially during that time when um, I didn't really know anybody else that did this strange hobby. It was very much kind of a taboo thing, at least in America, uh, before I left. Um, it was just seen as this weird little, like, why are you pointing that camera at your face sort of thing. And uh, to meet other people that actually did it and did it regularly and meeting people that I'd watched for years before I came out to Japan was a lot of fun and then getting just insanely <laughs> drunk with them and just having a good time, man. Some of those uh, YouTube meetup videos are some of my favorites to watch just because of how insanely drunk we got and just meeting and having, good, having a good time with fellow YouTubers. Um, it's definitely uh, a good time. So if you're out in Tokyo or something like that, I definitely recommend doing the meetups and stuff to meet fellow YouTubers. It's a really good networking opportunity and it's just a good time to have fun, cut loose, you know. <laughs> Question number nine, describe your most embarrassing moment in Japan. So this could kind of also tie in with question number eight, which was, you know, the most exciting, outrageous thing I've done. Um, and that was meeting uh, my guitar hero, Marty Friedman, who was also an inspiration for me to get a bit more serious about learning Japanese. Um, Cause I'd watch shows that he'd be on, he'd be speaking, you know, really fluent Japanese, and I'd just be like, man, if Marty can do this, I can do this too. So, you know, I just did some studying and stuff um, whenever I got time when I was stationed out in Japan, and uh, he had a little meetup event at uh, a little CD signing 
out in Shibuya one day and it was during the work week and normally I wouldn't go out to Tokyo during the work week just because I'd be so tired coming home after a long day uh, but that day I was just bound and determined to meet him so I just came straight home uh, changed and took this you know train straight to Tokyo to meet him and I was just thoroughly exhausted but I wanted to meet him anyway I spoke some Japanese to him um, it wasn't really that good but it was still good-ish, especially considering, you know, my level of Japanese at the time. Um, and he was really impressed that I knew that much for the short amount of time that I was in Japan at that time. And uh, we eventually talked a little bit in English as well. And I got it all on video, so if you want to watch that episode of Andy Japandi, uh, you can do that. Um, it's still kind of embarrassing for me to, to watch it, though, just because of how I act. But it's just my own little personal neuroticism, I guess. So moving on to question number 10. What's the biggest difference you've noticed between your home country and Japan? One of the big differences that I've noticed is just um, how conscious Japan is of the community and just how considerate you know the individual Japanese people are to other people around them. I think is probably you know the biggest thing that I love about Japan. Like in America everybody kind of fends for themselves and nobody's really considered about anyone else around them. They're just kind of in their own little space and if people don't like it they can just fuck right off and that gets like really annoying <laughs> to deal with and that was one of the big reverse culture shocks that I've had to deal with uh, when I came back to the States in 2015 and it still bothers me even today just how inconsiderate a lot of Americans are of other people but in Japan that's not so much the case a lot of them want to maintain the uh, overall harmony of the area you know in most cases didn't have any problems uh, Every once in a while you get on the late train and there'd be some drunk salarymen around causing a ruckus, but uh, nothing all that serious. I didn't really feel too in danger of stuff like that. Question number 11, what are the similarities? One of the things that I like um, about America is just how much of a melting pot it is, you know, different, different races, countries, cultures, things like that, um, that somehow just all combine into this one conglomerate. You know, they bring home over like different foods and stuff like that, and they somehow kind of make them Americanized, <laughs> I guess. Um, and that's something I've also noticed about Japan as well, is that, you know, as much flack as it gets for being a very homogenized culture, I think Japan is also kind of open to suggestions as far as taking influences from other countries as well. Um, so you'd see a lot of these like BuzzFeed type articles talking about, oh, Japan's got this weird hamburger. They got this kooky looking car. So they take a lot of influences from other cultures, uh, mostly America, but from other cultures as well. And they still find a way to Japanify it and make it uniquely Japanese. And I think that's really something that I find very similar between Japan and America is that they take these different cultural influences, but still you know, Japanify them or Americanize them, as it were, and make them their own. So question number 12, what is the best Japanese dish you've tried so far? Um, <laughs> that depends on your definition of Japanese. So the best food that I've had in Japan wasn't necessarily what you consider like Japanese food, but the best dish that I've had in Japan uh, was a, like a full course steak dinner out when I was visiting uh, Sasebo. Um, we went to this place called Steak Saloon, or Steak Salon, I think. And uh, I was gonna do like a whole video on it, but I only had like a couple clips. Um, I might release it as like a anti Japani lost episode, but it's not gonna be very long. I went to this place called Steak Salon, and uh, it was like 70 or $80 or something like that. It was kind of up there for a meal. But you get like a full course meal of stuff, and the steak was just like, expertly done um, I've never had steak that good before and it was just so awesome to have especially after a really long uh, training exercise session because um, we were out underway doing stuff and you know just to finish that up and have a nice steak dinner was definitely the icing on the cake so now as far as like what you would think of like traditional Japanese foods, probably some of the best things I've had was just a nice bowl of ramen at my local ramen shop uh, back in Yokosuka. 
Um, as silly as it may sound or as pedestrian as it may sound, um, one of the things I look forward to the most when coming back from those long underways out to sea was just having a nice hot bowl of ramen and just soaking in my big Japanese tub and just, you know, relaxing and taking it easy. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's the little things that you miss when you're out to sea fighting the good fight. So those are uh, some of the dishes that I've really enjoyed uh, being out in Japan. So question number 13, what's your Japanese drink of choice? Now, we've already talked about this a lot in this video. So we'll go over alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks. So as far as alcoholic drinks go, uh, chew high all the way. Japanese beers are okay. You know, they'll definitely get you by, but you know, it's really nothing to write home about unless you get like the super primo craft beer type stuff. Uh, but that stuff's gonna cost you, so just keep that in mind. Um, but for me, my main drink of choice was too high. I'd always get like a can or two after work and just chill out, you know? <laughs> get some food, drink some too high, and just, you know, have a good night. Um, as far as flavors go, I think uh, pineapple and green apple were my top fa favorite flavors of too high. Um, and then when I was out in town, I would get the peach one as well. That was a fun flavor to have. Now, as far as non-alcoholic drinks go, there's a lot of different stuff. Um, there's this one soda called Match. Um, it's kind of hard to explain the flavor. It kind of tastes like Smarties a little bit. Kind of has that weird lemon fruity-ish taste. Uh, it's really good. I would always get it when I would go to the arcades out in Yokosuka, out to uh, Plaza Capcom. It was just fun to like grab it, throw some coins in the arcade, and just like go to town. Um, another drink I would have regularly to kind of keep the stomach in check would be uh, Mitsuya Cider, which is basically like their version of 7-Up or Sprite, but it's a much like lighter flavor. It's just, you know, easier to digest and it's good for kind of upset stomachs from having too much chew high at night <laughs> waking up and like having to be a functioning human person in the morning. And then obviously, you know, the canned coffee. Taste wise, it's all right. It's nothing mind blowing, but I think I like it more for the convenience than for the taste. Just the fact that I can get a can of coffee, hot or cold from a vending machine anytime I want. is just, you know, something kind of fun about that, I think. So moving on to question number 14, What's the most useful Japanese product gadget you have bought? This one's kind of interesting because um, I didn't really buy a whole lot of electronics, um, a lot of Japanese electronics when I was out in Japan because, you know, I didn't know how they would work when I would eventually move back to America, so I didn't want to invest a whole lot into them. But it wouldn't even really be all that interesting, I guess. But uh, probably the most useful thing that I got from Japan was uh, like my train pass, you know, my Passmo card, and uh, my uh, bikes, my Jitencha. Went and bought one at the uh, local store, and it saved me like so much money in train fare getting back and forth to work. Because I lived pretty close to, uh, to base at the time, so eventually once I got my own place out there, um, I went and bought myself a bike, so I could just bike back and forth, and. It was a good way to get exercise and a good way to save a lot of money, as far as that goes. Um, so I know it's kind of a kind of a lame answer, but uh, it's probably the most uh, honest one. So moving on to question number fifteen, what intrigues you the most about Japanese culture? I think it's just the fact that it's like so different from American culture and just like American Western ideals, being individualist versus being collectivist. Um, you know, doing stuff for your own benefit versus doing stuff for the group's benefit. Um, I think that's one of the interesting, th interesting things about Japanese cultures is the fact that they, you know, want to preserve the, the harmony of the group versus, you know, individualist agendas. And, you know, it sounds kind of weird talking about it. You know, it, it may sound a little off uh, to Westerners, but uh, when you actually like experience it, it makes a lot of sense and uh, you know puts me more at ease thinking in more of a, an Eastern philosophy versus a Western philosophy. So moving on to question number 16, where do you go to escape in Japan? One of the places I would go uh, just to a lot of the surrounding parks 
in Yokosuka and other places. And, you know, if I was traveling around in Tokyo, um, you could probably go to like Yoyogi Park or someplace like that. The park near Harajuku that has the Meiji Shrine, there'd be times where I, I would just it'd feel like I'd just walking in a forest, like with nobody around. It'd just be great and just a good way to decompress from all the stress of, you know, all these people around you all the time. So those would be some places I would go to uh, to decompress. So moving on to question number 17. Whom in Japan do you most admire? It's kind of an interesting question because um, I touched on it earlier, you know, Marty Friedman being one of my inspirations to learn Japanese and get a bit more serious about it. So I definitely admire his ability to pick up the language and to you know, even when his Japanese wasn't really that good, to just continue to push himself to learn the language and to be more confident in pronunciations and just going for it, basically. So I'd probably have to pick him as far as, you know, people I admire in Japan. Um, and then there's a bunch of others who've kind of come and gone within the, uh, the J-vlogging community who I admired a lot. Probably the, the two most ones would be um, Tokyo Kuni, Kevin Kuni. Um, he's the one that really got me into J vlogging to begin with. And uh, of course, the uh, the late great Roger Swan, Tokyo Swan, Iwate Swan. He was definitely an inspiration as well. And he just felt like such, you know, an honest character, an honest person. And I think that's what I connected with the most when watching his videos. Moving on to question number 18. How do you spend your free time in Japan? So usually um, if it was during the week, I were, really wouldn't go out all that much. I'd probably just, you know, stay at home, uh, watch some stuff on the computer, drink some chew high, chill out, you know, just kind of relax at the end of a long day. But if it's during the, the weekend and I didn't have duty during that time, um, I'd probably just go out to either Yokohama or Tokyo and either meet up with my friends or just go to a different neighborhood, different spot that I hadn't gone to before and make a YouTube video. Um, I felt very much like in the creative flow when I was out in Japan. So it was a lot easier for me to just take my camera and go to a new place in Tokyo or Yokohama or wherever and just make a video. So moving on to question number 19. What do you dislike about Japan? One of the things that I didn't like about Japan was just feeling um, very, <laughs> just very, very overweight in Japan. Um, even though I was starting to get a little heavy back when I was in Japan, you just, you feel a lot more heavy than you actually are, especially considering the size of most of the other people and, you know, just the size of different things and, you know, the sidewalks are a lot smaller and uh, the little aisle hallways and stuff like that and stores are a lot narrower. So I just feel like just this big, awkward person walking around sometimes. And that probably was one of the things I didn't like about Japan, but you know, that's, that's my own fault for getting that way. So, you know, if I lost some weight and stuff, it probably wouldn't feel that awkward. And it's mostly just due to my own personal neuroses, as it were, um, just my own self-consciousness, basically. Um, and I was actually watching one of my, um, earlier videos back when I was in Japan. I remember just, you know, thinking I was fat and gross back then, but you know, looking at it now, you know, three to four years later, I'm just like, Jesus Christ. I feel like, you know, if I hit that, if I hit that weight, I'd be like sitting pretty good, you know? But then again, I was around a lot of people that were much more in shape than I was. So I felt even though I looked pretty average, at least by American standards. Um, I felt just very overweight and gross and just like a complete blob of a human being. And then the final question here, question number 20, uh, do you have any words of advice for people wanting to live, work, or travel to Japan? There's a lot that, can, that I can say about, you know, people wanting to come out to Japan. You know, save up m as much money as you can. It may be a while before you can get a job or you know, be able to make some kind of money out in Japan, whether you're, you know, going to work there, you know, you got that English teaching job or whatever the case may be. Uh, it may take a couple weeks up to a month before you start 
getting those checks coming in. Or if you're just going there as a student, uh, definitely save money because, you know, you might have the ability to do some kind of like work study program, depending on what college you go to and what their arrangements are. But you also got to look at like your visa restrictions and stuff like that with working as a student you can only work so many hours a week and stuff like that uh, have a budget definitely you don't want to go out and spend a whole shit ton of money you know that's that's another reason why i drank too high is because it's like really cheap compared to drinking beer and going out to the bars and freaking golden guy and stuff like that and, you know you just got to be practical about a lot of things and you know there's a there's a lot of ways to live very cheaply in japan you know you can go to a lot of these discount stores and you know, get really good food for not a lot of money. You know, you don't have to go to these fancy restaurants out in Tokyo and stuff like that and, you know, eat out there every night. Um, that should definitely be like a once in a while sort of thing if you want to be a bit more budget conscious. Being here, enjoying the culture, enjoying the place where you're at, obviously keep an open mind to things. Um, Japan's gonna be most likely a lot different than where you're from. Wherever, wherever it is, you know, if it's US, Canada, UK, Australia, um, it's gonna be a lot more different than what you're accustomed to culture-wise. So be sure to keep an open mind and, you know, just respect the culture. And, you know, the more open you are to it, the more opportunities you get for connecting with uh, the locals as well as with other foreigners, uh, depending on what your interests are. And, you know, just try new things, you know, you didn't, spend all that money to come to Japan to eat McDonald's every night. You know, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's okay to eat it every once in a while, but uh, don't make a habit of it because a lot of, you know, Western food is both expensive and there's not as many options of it as there are back here in the States. So you're pretty much just gonna be eating McDonald's and maybe Burger King if you're you know, lucky enough. So yeah, guys, that was the Japan Tag 2.0. Um, if you'd like to participate, be sure to leave a video response in the comments down below in the boobity boop. Just send like a little video link or whatever. We'll get you going with that and I'll be sure to watch them, comment, stuff like that. And uh, with that said, guys, this is the Andy San. Sign for now. As always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye.